So you've just bought a beam gauge system and you just pulled it out of the box. What do you do next? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to install your software. Once the software is installed, then you're going to connect your camera. A lot of them are going to be a USB-based camera. You're going to go ahead and make that connection to the camera, and the computer is going to find that camera and, and allow you to be able to connect to it. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to launch that beam gauge software. It's going to take a couple of minutes for beam gauge to start. And while that's starting, we're going to go ahead and we're going to mount this camera on an optical post. And we've got a laser here that's running today, and this is just a little Heaney laser, so it's relatively eye safe. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to take the camera and we're going to position it roughly in the beam path. And we're going to use beam gauge at that point to really find the rest of the beam path and make sure we're properly aligned. So on the front of the camera today, we've got a couple of ND filters. We're going to talk a little bit about those ND filters. Those ND filters are basically sunglasses to the laser. It's going to bring that intensity down so we're not overdriving that camera. A lot of the filters that Ophir Spirocon provides actually are C-mount threaded. and You can just screw them right onto the camera. You can stack them up. You can rearrange the order. One of the things you need to be aware of is when you're attenuating the laser, we want to knock it down incrementally. If you knock it down too fast, you can cause what's called thermal lensing in the filters. And when that happens, you're basically causing the filter, instead of being just perfectly flat, you're causing it to turn into a lens. And that can cause a focus spot to occur, or you can actually cause damage to the filter. So what we want to do is we want to step the light down incrementally. Start it with a little bit by, out by the source and bring it down in steps. So put the lightest filter closest to the laser the darkest filter is going to go to the camera. Now all of our, our filters are actually kind of color coded. The red filter is an ND1. The black filter is an ND2. ND, when we're talking in ND, what ND means is neutral density or optical density. And ND1 is going to allow 10% transmission. It's going to absorb 90%. And ND2 is going to allow 1%, it's going to block, it's going to absorb 99%. So what we're going to do is we're going to be stepping this down incrementally. We've got a couple of filters on the front of the camera. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and align this so we can see our laser beam profile. There's our laser. And what we can also see is we can see that we're overdriving the camera. We've got a lot of white on that screen. So what we can do is we're going to add another ND filter to the front of this camera and it just threads right on. And when you thread it on, we highly recommend that you keep your hands and eyes protected. Keep your hands out of the beam path. So this is just going to thread right on there. And now we can see we've actually attenuated a little bit too much. Our signal's way down there in the noise. There's a couple of things we can do here. One of the things we could do is we could increase the gain coming from the camera. Or we could take the filter off and we could use some exposure control to be able to attenuate it. Or we could get the proper ND filtering. We could change the filter instead of it being an ND1, we could go to maybe a 0.7 or to an ND.3. Well, I'd be able to get a little bit closer there. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to block the laser. And we're going to do our ultra cal. Now it's important that when you do your, your ultra cal, make sure you don't block the input to the camera, block the source. A lot of people will actually just put a cover over the camera this way, and that's not the proper way to do it. We want to block the beam so that any ambient conditions are still being taken care of by the camera. So once we've done our ultra cal, take our block out of the way and we can kind of see our beam here some of the things you're going to want to be looking for in your camera. We're going to zoom in a little bit so we can see a little bit more in detail what's going on here. There. So some of the things that you're looking for when you're doing your laser beam profiling, you can see here on the screen We've got some bullseye patterns. Those bullseye patterns are typically there from dust on a filter. And the easiest way to find that is actually just grabbing one of the filters and giving it a rotation. And rotate as many filters as you need to until you actually find the one that's causing. There's our piece that's getting, causing one of those to cause that distortion. And when you see that, you're going to need to take that filter off, clean it. Usually to clean your filter, you're going to use canned air 
or if you absolutely have to, you can use your drop and drag technique to, to clean that filter. You want to have your filters good and clean so you don't see these bullseye patterns because that's from the filter. It's not really truly in your laser. Some of the other things you're going to be looking for when you're doing your beam profile measurements is distortions from the camera itself. Sometimes you might see a pixel that's over here that's black and that might be a piece of dirt that's on the, on the camera. And when you take your filters off the camera, make sure you point the camera at the floor so you use gravity in your favor to actually pull dust particles or the filter away from the detector as you're mounting it. But if you see those black spots on the detector, sometimes you can clean it. Most often we recommend that you actually send the camera back to us and we can clean it for you during our camera recertification process. Sometimes you'll see a white pixel. If you see a white pixel, that means it's a fully turned on pixel. And if you see that, the camera's going to need to come back to the factory to actually get recalibrated. Because we can do some corrections on some of those pixels. But if you see a white pixel in the camera, quite often your cursors will snap over and get stuck on that one pixel. And it won't be able to find your peak anymore. Because the peak is going to be to that one pixel. So if you see white spots in your images, or you see black spots in your images, you probably want to contact us about getting the camera back in and getting it recertified. But once you've got a good beam profile on the screen, you're going to want to optimize your signal to noise ratio, make sure it's good and balanced, that your signal, you want to make sure that this signal level is coming up on these color bar over here, up and into the orange or into the red region. That way we're getting the best dynamic range out of the camera. For what we have today, we're a little low on that scale. And so ideally, we would probably want to remove a filter. So I'm going to go ahead and take that filter out. And instead, what I can use is I can use some exposure control. I'm going to click on my source tab. And I'm going to take my top bar and I'm going to slide that down so it's going to attenuate my beam a little bit more. And I want to get that down just underneath the red region. Because when I do my ultra cal, my baseline's actually going to drop a little bit. So now that I've got a relatively good signal on my screen, I'm going to go ahead and block it again, redo my ultra cal. And when UltraCal finishes, we'll have a good balanced signal on the screen. There we go. Some other things you're going to want to watch for is making sure that you're good and centered in your camera. If you're off to one side versus the other, it's not too bad. But ideally, you do want to be in the center. Because beam gauge will still make a good valid beam width measurement, even though my beam might be clear up to the very edge of the, of the imager. I'm still getting good numbers. But if you can, ideally, you do want to center that beam in, on the camera. Beam gauge is looking at your signal, but then in the outside edges here, this is our noise. And we want to make sure that beam gauge has a good balance of noise. We want to make sure that we're seeing some negative pixels and some positive pixels because they're going to cancel each other out. And when you're doing a beam profile measurement, we watch out in the perimeter to make sure that this distribution of noise is uniformly random, that it's not heavily weighted one way or the other. Because if I'm a little positive, my beam diameter is going to be way too big. If I'm a little negative, then my beam diameter is actually going to be reported too small. So we want our noise to be good and balanced so that it's close to zero way out in the wings. And then we're getting a good valid beam measurement. Some of the other things that we're watching for when we're doing a beam profile measurement is spurious noise on the detector. And when we say spurious noise, we're talking about optical noise. And what you can see we have here today is we've got a fun little spot right over here. That's actually a back reflection from one of our ND filters. So if you see that, you're going to want to make sure that you get that off the detector. That can be a matter of tilting the filter a little bit, maybe loosening it, adjusting it so it's out of the way. Because if this gets in, into our beam diameter measurement, it can cause beam, beam gauge to, to compute a too large a beam diameter. So that's one thing that you're looking for. Is you're looking for these satellite beams, is what, what sometimes they're called. Make sure you don't have those, or if they are, maybe you need to use an aperture to isolate them. What we can see is that auto aperture is actually doing a pretty good job of isolating it because it's not stretching to include that. 
But if you do see them, that's what you're seeing. So a lot of times you can just rotate a filter and you can see how it's moving around as I rotate that filter. Make sure that's outside of your beam path and preferably off the detector if at all possible. Some of the things that we're seeing on the, on the UltraCal screen. Along the bottom here, what we're seeing is we're seeing a camera update rate. Right now we're running at about seven to eight hertz. This is telling you how fast beam gauge is collecting data from your camera. What we're also seeing is there's a little stopwatch there. That little stopwatch tells us every time the camera outputs a frame, we collected it, we ran the numbers on it, and we showed it to you. This next little indicator is telling us are we in results priority mode or frame priority mode. If the arrows are up, we're in frame priority. If the arrows are down, we're in results priority. These other two indicators are for a reference subtraction or for UltraCal. This UltraCal one is very critical. We highlight them in green if, if it's been done. If it hasn't been done, they're gray. Or if it's bad, it's red. So if I turn off UltraCal, you can see, there we go. It hasn't been done. But if I turn on UltraCal and I make a setting change to the camera, now I know I have a bad UltraCal. So that's something you're gonna wanna watch for as you're doing your beam profiling measurements. Is make sure that your UltraCal is good. It needs to be in the green. If it's red, take a minute, block the source, re UltraCal, and then go ahead and make your measurements again. This slider bar that's just running here is just indicating where we currently are in the frame buffer. Let's just know how many frames we're at. There's also a counter that tells you how many we're counting up to, so you can scroll back through that. So if I pause, I can rewind and I can look at previous data. And those are beam profiles that are stored in my frame buffer. So there's one where I'm ultra cald and I have no beam on the screen. I can increase that number by clicking on my capture tab and changing how many are in my frame buffer. So if I, if I save a beam gauge data file, Depending upon how big that buffer is, that's the data that I can save. That's what's been recorded. So if I want to record more, I expand that frame buffer to as many as I need to. And then I can save either one, or I can save all, or I can save as many from that buffer that I would like to.